like to welcome everyone to this webinar this evening, uh, Expedition Japan, Commodore Perry's Hidden Interest in Science. Uh, it's 6.29 p.m., so we have another minute or so before we begin. Uh, as attendees are joining, we have uh, 216 people uh, registered for this evening's event, and uh, I'm looking at the participant list, and we're already at 77 uh, signing in. So. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining, and we will be underway uh, in just a moment. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone for joining the webinar tonight. Uh, we are uh, waiting for everyone to dial in. It's still a minute or so early, uh, so thanks again for joining. Mm And while we are waiting for uh, everyone to join, I'm going to just uh, launch a poll and ask people to tell us, those that are on board so far, uh, where they're calling in from. Uh, and you should see on your screen, uh, Japan, United States, or other. Uh, so those of you who are already on the line, if you wanna answer that, we'll leave this up here for uh, 20 seconds or so. And it looks like 86% uh, are in the United States and uh, the remainder in Japan, uh, which is a great um, uh, distribution. So I'm going to uh, share this with everyone so you can see the uh, vast majority of you calling in from the US. Thank you. And some people uh, up early in the morning, 7.30 AM, Japan Standard Time. Um, thank you for that. Uh, and then while we're waiting uh, for everyone, I uh, would like to um, launch a second poll and ask you uh, if you knew that Commodore Matthew C. Perry had an interest in science. And I'm only giving you a yes and no <laughs> response here. Uh, vast majority so far, almost 80% are saying no, 20% uh, saying yes. So interesting, a couple people uh, on the line here who did uh, know this. Um, and I'm going to launch, uh, I'm going to share this with, with everyone uh, so you can see. And uh, it's 631. Uh, we have most people on the line, but I'm going to ask one final poll question while we're waiting for everyone to join. And uh, this is a question about the importance of US-Japan cooperation in the sciences. How important do you think uh, this is? How important is US-Japan cooperation in, in the science? Uh, uh, four different possible responses here. Uh, vast majority saying extremely important uh, and the remainder saying important. Um, so you're going to learn some interesting things about the roots of uh, US-Japan scientific cooperation tonight. So I'll share this with everyone and then I think we'll get started. Uh, so thank you everyone. Uh, so once again, I would very much like to wish everyone a good evening uh, and welcome you to this webinar uh, titled uh, exhibition, uh, Expedition Japan, Commodore Perry's Hidden Interest in Science. Uh, I am David Jaynes, Managing Director of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation and Senior Advisor for Institutional Development at OIST in Okinawa. And this tonight is the second webinar in our OIST Foundation's US-Japan Science webinar series. Thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. The mission of the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology Foundation is to promote innovative global scientific breakthroughs through enhancing and strengthening science and technology research and related programs at OIST and to empower Americans to support the sustainable development of Okinawa and deepen US-Japan relations through OIST. And our webinar series plays a role in that. Uh, this is webinar tonight will be on the record and recorded. And I would like to let you all know how to interact with us and ask questions. Uh, there are many ways to do that uh, through Zoom, but tonight we would like to ask you to uh, write your questions in the chat uh, function. Uh, any questions that you have, we encourage you to ask those uh, early on and I will be collecting those. And toward the end of the program, uh, there will be a Q&A period uh, where we will respond to those questions. So without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, now introduce our moderator this evening, uh, Mr. Peter Kelly. Peter is president of the National Association of Japan America Societies 
And he also runs the Mondro Whitfield Commemorative Center for International Exchange in the US. And it's through that organization uh, that I met uh, Dr. Matthew Perry, our speaker tonight, and I thank him for being with us. Both NAJAS and CIEUS are co-sponsoring tonight's event, and I thank uh, uh, Peter for that and, and everyone in those organizations. Peter has a long experience uh, with and in Japan, both in the private and the nonprofit sector. He worked for Teradyne, and he was also executive director of the Harvard Yenching Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He's a graduate of Harvard College, and he also attended the University of Maine School of Law. And he has been awarded the Foreign Minister's Commendation by the Government of Japan for his work in the support of the commemorations of the 70th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Most importantly to me, uh, Peter is a great friend and mentor, and I thank him for being here tonight and moderating uh, this event. So I will turn it over to you now, Peter. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. It's a real pleasure to, uh, to, to join you with your, in your wonderful work for the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and, uh, and, and Matt. Matt, David, and I are all board members of the Committee for International Exchange US, which runs the uh, Japan America Grassroots Summits every year in commemoration of the first uh, encounter of Japanese and, and Americans, Captain Whitfield and, uh, and Manjiro. We all hope that you will look up the Japan America Grassroots Summits and think about attending the one next year in, uh, in Wakayama in Japan. This uh, presentation tonight is, uh, is, is going to be very interesting. It's, um, it deals with an aspect of the Perry expedition to Japan in 1853 that most people don't know about. Many of the voyages of discovery in the 19th century did have a scientific uh, element and, uh, and, and this one did too, as well as the desire to open Japan to the United States and commerce. The speaker is uh, a, a good old friend, Matthew, Matthew Calbraith Perry, same name as the Commodore himself. Matt is the emeritus scientist at the Patuxent Wildlife Research Center of the US uh, Geographical Service. He's also a relative of Commodore Perry himself. And Matt has done a lot of wonderful work in understanding the, the uh, details of the journey that, that Commodore Perry took and the implications it has had on the US-Japan relationship. Tonight's focus is gonna be on the scientific aspect, which plays well to, uh, to Matt's scientific career at the, at the Geographic Service, and also his, his personal interest. Matt is a, uh, is, uh, is a, is a, is a, uh, a birder, and you will see pic wonderful pictures of the birds that were discovered in Japan by the, uh, by the Perry Expedition. It'll take me about 30 minutes, and then uh, after that, I'll ask Matt a couple of questions, but both David and I will be anxious to hear your questions and collect them up and, uh, and uh, present them to Matt for responses during the Q&A session. So let us, uh, you see on your, uh, on your screen the, the, uh, the, you, the American and the Japanese pictures of Commodore Perry, and you see on your screen also the descendant of Commodore Perry, Matthew Perry himself. Take it away, Matt. Thanks a lot, Peter. This is a real pleasure and an honor. And thanks a lot to David for uh, organizing this webinar. And uh, I welcome all my friends who, who signed up for this, and especially all, all my good friends in Japan, Ohio to you. So I wanna talk tonight about the science uh, aspects of the expedition. I'm not an expert on that area, but I've just done a little research in that uh, over the years, and I pulled some things together which I think will be of interest to you. Uh, the picture of uh, Commodore Perry on your screen was a photograph uh, by Matthew Brady, who was the famous photographer in the Civil War, and this was what Perry looked like when he went on the expedition. Uh, the, uh, he had a good head of hair, although some people said he wore a, had a wig. He didn't, and uh, he's in full dress here. He was pretty proud of his uniform. The uh, painting on the right, of course, is from Japan. Uh, that's a more complimentary one that they did. They had a lot of other ones that weren't as complimentary. And of course, at that time, there was a lot of talk about Americans being barbarians, and we had uh, some bad feelings about Japan also at that time. So it was a good time for uh, Perry to go to Japan and 
make things a little better there. And uh, we'll talk uh, more about that um, as we go along. And there we go. Uh, briefly, this is a picture of Perry uh, when he became a uh, master commandant in 1826. And uh, it shows, uh, well, it shows the two epaulets, which is interesting because at that time, they, if you were a lieutenant, you only had one. But he started his career early when he was 14 years old as a midshipman and served uh, uh, underneath uh, Com Commodore Rogers, who was very famous uh, at that time as, as one of the leaders of the Navy. He became a lieutenant in 1813, but before then he had served as a midshipman in the War of 1812 and also as a lieutenant in the War of 1812. His brother, Oliver Hazard Perry, was a Commodore and was famous for the Battle of Lake Erie when uh, he met the enemy and they are ours. And he had, of course, used the battleship flag, because they don't give up the ship, which is famous, especially at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. In the 1820s, uh, he had several accomplishments. He went to uh, Key West and laid the, put the flag in the ground at Key West. At that time, it was still uh, not too sure who owned Key West. So by doing that, we claimed Key West. And so it was a very important thing at that time, although we don't talk much about it now, go down there and enjoy the sun and, uh, and have fun down there. But at that time, it could have been owned by uh, Spain or even Cuba. He also, during the uh, 1820s, was involved in hunting pirates in the Caribbean, also went to the Mediterranean to uh, try to do away with the pirate piracy that was going on there. And he became also fairly well known in the 30s for repatriate, re repatriating sl free slaves from the United States, taking them back to Africa, and then also trying to, to knock back the slave trade that was going on, even though we outlawed slavery in 1808. It was still going on by some Americans. So he was influential in that. And then in uh, 1837, he became a captain. And then he had shore duties in several areas, Charleston Navy Base, but then also at the Brooklyn Yard. And that's where he became a Commodore because the Commodore at that time was the highest rank that anyone could have in the Navy. And it meant that you had two commands, either a command of a ship and a command of a squadron like he had when he went to Japan. But at the Brooklyn Shipyard, he had command of the station as well as the Navy Yard. So he had two, two commands at that time. This is his residence there. And it was a time where he really got involved in science and technology. He created the Lyceum, which was the Naval Lyceum was a very important thing at that time because he was encouraging people, all the captains in the Navy in the United States to bring information back from other countries. And he was talking about anything that was natural any books or anything that could increase our information about other countries, because we were still trying to learn more. He was very involved with education. He set up a uh, training ship uh, for midshipmen, but that didn't work out as well as he had planned. In fact, he probably one of the low points in his career when he did that, but he was also pushing for the Naval Academy. And he was one of the influential people that established the first curriculum of the Naval Academy, which was formed in 1845. He pushed for steam power at a time when a lot of the old salts did not want to deal with it because they thought it wasn't reliable. And he said, it's, go it's going to be, and he kept pushing for it. He was big on having lighthouses along the coast, especially important down in Key West where so many ships were going aground. And he pushed for ordnance reform. At that time, we were using just one large, heavy cannonball. But the British and the French had already developed a, a cannonball that exploded on contact. A lot of the old salts didn't like that, and there were some bad accidents when they went off prematurely, but he pushed hard for it, and eventually it was successfully used in, in our Navy. And the other thing he pushed for, which was also before his time, before uh, anybody realized how important ironclad ships were, because he put steam power into the ships, he wanted the, the engine rooms to be protected with uh, iron. So he, he had first use of iron to protect the the ship, the uh, engine rooms, but then also it was used for the whole ship. And then it became important as a uh, battering ram. Everybody thought that was ridiculous at, per at first, but it was used successfully during uh, the Civil War. He, of course, he's most famous for opening Japan to the West. Uh, and, but the other thing that he's famous for is being called the father of the steam navy. And 
we always think of Fulton as being the father of the steam power, but Perry was the father of, of the steam Navy. He took the first uh, ship to Washington from the Brooklyn shipyard. It was called the Fulton, the Fulton II. It was a steamship. He took it to Washington and President Van Buren came aboard. At that time, they didn't think too much about steam, but Perry was good at convincing them that it could be effective. This is the steam power ship that was uh, built in the 1930s. He used this in the, uh, I mean, uh, 1941, I'm sorry. He used this in the Mexican War. It was his favorite ship, but he's also the ship that he took to Japan. This is a U.S. ship uh, a frigate, uh, Mississippi. This was his squadron flagship. He had three flagships that he used during his time in Japan, the Mississippi, the Susquehanna, and the Powhatan. The Powhatan was the one that he had finally had the treaty uh, signed on. So this is him uh, going across. I'm not sure exactly where this is located. It shows a lot more ships around him than he actually had but it's a, sort of a, a artist rendition of what it looked like to have steam coming out of two stacks, but also have mass for sails. So it wasn't considered a total steam ship, but it had also the ability to, to have sails. At that time, they were using 20 tons of coal a day to propel these ships. So whenever they had a good wind, they certainly cut off the engines and lowered the stacks and then went by sail alone. Was, this was one of his major issues of establishing a trip across the Atlantic. Uh, at that time, a lot of ships were going around Cape Horn of South America, but he went out of Norfolk across the Atlantic to Madeira, where he picked up a lot of wine, and then down around Africa, stopping at Cape Town and coming up, stopping at Mauritius, going over to Ceylon, and then on, on to Singapore, and then up to Hong Kong, to Shanghai, and then finally going to Japan. He went to Okinawa first, Naha, went across the Bonin Islands, and then eventually into Edo Bay, Tokyo, on March 8th, 1953. So he started in November of, I mean, 1853. He started in Norfolk in November uh, 52, and ended up in Japan in July 53, 1853. So it was a, a major undertaking because he needed to have coal at all his stops. All this was planned ahead in advance. No satellite phones at that time. So he had to be sending messages by ship to have all these arrangements made so he could get, get coal at each one of these ports. He arrived at uh, Great Luchu, which is uh, now of course known as Okinawa, but throughout his uh, time, it was called uh, Luchu Islands. Originally, they had a closer association with China than they did with Japan, but later, of course, uh, Japan claimed them and took it over. He wasn't uh, allowed to enter immediately. It took, just like in, in mainland Japan, he had to do some negotiations. He wanted to have his welcoming at the Shuri Castle through the Gate of Courtesy. The, the Okinawans resisted that, but they finally relented and let him come in. Of course, this beautiful area was destroyed during World War II, and then more recently, in, it was rebuilt and then destroyed again in a, in a fire. So it's a, it's a very historic area in Okinawa, but unfortunately, it has done some, has been through some terrible things. He arrived in uh, Edo Bay, Tokyo Bay at Uraga in July 8th, 1853. And one of the first things he did is he had his men go out and sound the area. You can see the man at the bow here of the boat throwing out a lead weight. And that's how they did sounding at that time. This was before sonar. You got to realize that we didn't have at this, he didn't have all the electronic devices that we have nowadays. So he wanted to find out where the best parts of the harbor were. And this was mainly because he wanted to get his ships as close to land as possible in case there were any problems. He was ready to bombard the whole coastline. The other thing, of course, is he was very interested in the technology about the, the depth of the water. He was making maps. He had already had maps from the Germans who were located in Nagasaki at that time, but this whole area had not been mapped as well for the whole world, and he was very involved with doing that. So he had all these soundings done in El Bay, and then eventually, uh, he later on, he did measurements of the tide, and he did that through this device here. This is a uh, 
from a scroll, from the black ship scroll that Oliver Statler, the author of the Japanese Inn, uh, wrote beautiful uh, pictures, paintings, what the Japanese did of Perry's visit. So here they're taking uh, tide measurements and Perry was big on this because he knew how important the tide was in regards to the depth of the water, but also the currents. And so these were being done in uh, Shimoda area. And he said the tides are governed by, by mysterious things. Uh, some of them, the laws and the wisdom of man has not entirely welcomed. And of course, at that time, they were dealing with celestial navigation using the sextant, zodiacal lights, which a whole volume of his narrative is, is using that to des describe his, uh, his whole trip across the ocean and in, into Japan. He finally landed at Kuriyama on July 14th, 1853, after he was assured that he would be welcomed. And he was very reluctant to go in until he could meet with the highest people in Japan and be welcomed. And he delivered the letter from President Fillmore on July 14th, 1853. And the letter was addressed to my great and good friend. At that time, the Americans didn't totally understand who they were dealing with, whether it was the emperor or the shogun. And of course, the shogun was really more in control and the emperor, even though he had a big name and all, wasn't in con control as much as the shogun was. But he left immediately and went, spent the winter in China. And then he came back to Yokohama on March 8, 1854. And one of the things he wanted to do was to find a good place to go ashore. Yokohama had the deepest area, which he knew based on his soundings that he had done in the bay. And this is where he wanted to go ashore and bring his troops in and uh, make, make the uh, first contact with the Japanese. Uh, sort of interesting, this tree in Japan and Yokohama still exists. That was a pretty famous tree in Japan and there's a uh, nice area there where you, you can get a lot of good history of the landing that still exists in, in Yokohama. But now the land area probably goes out as far, as far as the ships are. A lot of this has been filled in, so Yokohama Harbor has uh, been expend, extended quite a bit. One of the things he did is he had planned to give the Japanese a lot of gifts. He wanted the Japanese to realize the advances the Western world had made in regards to uh, one of the big things was the railroad. We had established steam power. The Japanese knew about steam power, but they did not know about steam power for locomotion. There was no knowledge of that. Or if they had the knowledge, it wasn't widely known. And so this was a big thing to bring a model train that was built in Philadelphia by the Norris Company and lay out all the tracks that the engine and the cars could run on. And so this was a new thing for the Japanese. The other thing that was new was a telegraph line. Here you can see in the background here, these are poles and a wire that was extended for the telegraph being used, uh, uh, Morse, Morse code was being used at that time. So that's another thing he showed. But he also brought a lot of uh, agricultural in, in, instruments and he wanted to see what the Japanese had and they brought also a lot of agricultural seeds and all. So this took place on March 13th, 1854. Now see, these are some of the gifts that I've been interested in for a long time. This is a balance that, that he gave the Japanese because I mentioned the, the engine. Here you can see one of the commissioners actually riding on the model train as it went around the tracks. Uh, we had, tel the Japanese had telescopes, but this is a, a more advanced one that he brought along and gave one to the emperor. This is a, a Doland uh, telescope, famous for the English and the French uh, development of the telescope. And the other thing was the telegraph machine that was used to send the message. I've always been intrigued with this very rough Japanese sketch of the machine, and I always wanted to see it. And through some of my friends, I found out that it was located at the Postal Museum in Japan. So last year, I made a, a trip to Japan, and I ended up at the Postal Museum, which had been closed in previous years because of the earthquake they had. And I met the curator of the Postal Museum, uh, Makiko Kikuchi, and she was very nice. Uh, when I mentioned the machine to her, she says, well, it's locked up because it's a national treasure. She said, but if you give me 20 minutes, I'll set it up for you. And I said, sure. So I waited 20 minutes and uh, she set it up for me. It was in this uh, box uh, hidden away in one of the dark uh, back rooms that nobody sees at the museum. 
but she got it out and showed it to me and we had a, a great time uh, chatting with her uh, through my in, in, interpreter that I had. I gave her a copy of a little brochure that I had written a little booklet and she was pleased to get that. So very thankful for having that visit with her. On March 27th, 1854, Commodore Perry put on a big celebration for the Japanese. And at this time, they used a lot of Kentucky bourbon and a lot of Japanese sake that was used. And they had quite a celebration ab aboard his uh, flagship, the Powhatan. You can see some of the big guns that are on the deck here. Also, uh, here's the bridge house and the band playing up above here. And it was quite a celebration. And then one of the Japanese commissioners said in good English, Japan and America, all the same heart. And that was showed the, what was happening between the Japanese and the Americans. The, the uh, distrust was breaking down and they were becoming more friendly with each other. So on March 31st, 1854, the Treaty of Kanagawa, the Peace and Amity Treaty was finally signed between Japan and the United States. And it brought peace and friendship, or it called for peace and friendship between USA and Japan. The opening of two ports, Shimoda and Hakodate. Uh, Perry was happy with this, although he wanted more to be opened up, but he, he agreed to this. The Japanese agreed to assist with wrecked ships and protection of shipmates. We had a lot of people from whaling missions that hadn't been protected in the past, and Perry insisted on having this, and that Japan would supply coal, water, and other provisions for any ships stopping in the area. Of course, he insisted that we pay for it. We were not trying to get anything for free, but we wanted to pay for it. So the treaty was uh, not everything that Perry wanted. It was probably a lot more than the Japanese wanted to give up, but it was uh, signed and, and people agreed to it. There were a few things that turned out later to be a little confusing, but we won't go into that right now. After the treaty was signed, they had a Japanese reception. This took place the uh, same day, March 31st, 1854, and Perry witnessed the first sumo wrestling that uh, any Americans had seen. After the uh, expedition, he took his journal and three volumes were written on, based on his uh, journal that he kept every day. And this uh, now has been translated in Japanese just about 10 years ago, it uh, got translated into Japanese. Before then, the Japanese didn't have this except from the English edition. Perry wanted to get authors that had big names. He was convinced this was going to be a best-selling book. And he asked Washington Irving, Irving uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Bayard Taylor, and they all rejected. They were all busy or too late in their career, uh, and so they rejected. He finally settled on the rector of his church, Reverend Dr. Francis Hawks. And this was the Calvary Church in New York, a very well-known uh, author, and he agreed to, to write the narrative. And 5,000 copies were made. Uh, two of them, uh, one and volume three, were done printed by the Senate. Volume two was printed by the House of Representatives, slightly different size. Uh, and that was because Perry had a lot of problems getting one part written by one of his uh, people that were on board. And I'll talk more about that in a little while. This is what the uh, title page looks like on the volume two. And this is the one that deals with a lot of the science, uh, deals with natural history, agriculture, Luchu Islands, opponent islands, and a lot of the exploration that was done in those areas and also in Japan. So this was published in 1856 out of Washington at our government expense. And it, uh, like I say, got 5,000 copies, but not uh, widely known by any means. Perry said a couple of interesting things in regards to science in his narrative. He said, in the equipment of Japan expedition, scientific researchers, researchers were to be considered of secondary importance. And the reason for this is he had had bad experience when he had scientists on board in the past and other people that were not under his command. And other ships had the same problem. At that time, the Navy didn't have the control of the people on board like we do nowadays. Nowadays, everybody comes under the captain's command, but people from Congress and all would go on a ship and they thought the ship was their taxi to take them any place in the world. So Perry brought an end to that. And so all the people on board that were collecting the science information were under his control. He said, I fully believe the officers of the several vessels would be sufficiently competent to accomplish all in the way of science. And that, true, that turned to be true. Everything they collected was double-checked back in Washington 
by scientists uh, in many parts of the country, back in the United States. He gave commands to his men, said, employ such portions of his time as may be spared from the regular duties and proper hours of relaxation to collect information on a variety of subjects. The total subjects he had for this trip were 21. So if you were an officer and had any education and had an interest in knowledge, you could pick one of these subjects and fill your idle time getting more information. At that time, most of the information came from uh, Siebold, who was a German who was located in Nagasaki, and the Dutch were allowed in there. Siebold was part of the Dutch factory there in Nagasaki, and so he had collected information. But of course, because he was in Nagasaki, a lot of the information was from the southern part of Japan, and nobody had really researched the northern part, especially Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan. So <clears throat> this is what Perry knew about. It was written in 1833 to 1850. Unfortunately, a lot of the scientific names weren't correct, and there's been some, a lot of corrections that needed to be done in, in the past. And of course, a lot of the scientific names that Perry used in his volumes also have to be corrected over the years. This is a night camp they used on Lu Chu. They essentially used uh, Okinawa as a first place to test a lot of the techniques that Perry wanted to use in mainland Japan on the main island. And so they used these uh, tents uh, set up where they could do their research studies on plants and animals. And then they also, after they made better friends with the Okinawans, they got uh, use of several homes where they could set up. Here's a uh, picture of his artist, uh, Wilhelm Heine, who was a German descent person who was on board as the best artist. And I'll show you some of his work in a little while. <clears throat> this is uh, the page, the first page of the uh, geological exploration in Luchu. Not too much was said in, in this part of the narrative, but it was mainly to find out whether, where the coal was. Perry was convinced he could find coal in Luchu. And so George Jones went out and did uh, quite a bit of reconnaissance. I always have to laugh when I see the name George Jones because George Jones is a, in the United States was a country singer. And he was one of my favorite singers for many years. I love to hear George Jones sing. He died in uh, 2013. But the interesting thing, George Jones and the Reverend George Jones, who was Commodore Perry's chaplain, had a thing in common. They both had a drinking problem. And George Jones, who was pretty well known in the United States as a singer, he get the nickname of No Show Jones because there were so many concerts he didn't show up for. But Reverend Jones in 1854 also got into trouble with drinking because one day he had a little too much and although Perry insisted that be the, no proselytizing of religion, because at that time, a lot of Christians thought they should spread the word throughout the world about Christianity. Perry insisted that they not do that on the mission. They were focused on one thing and not to do any missionary work. Well, George Jones, after he had a little too much to drink, went out on a mission once, and he was trying to find some converts. But the Japanese followed him. They finally sent word after he'd gone by the limits that the Japanese had established around the towns. They sent word back to Commodore Perry. Perry sent the Marines after him and George Jones was dragged back to the ship and reprimanded by Commodore Perry. <laughs> so that's the story about George Jones, of two George Jones. George Jones also provided detailed data and charts of the zodiacal lights, which was so important in regards to navigation and received much praise from scholars after that. He was a good friend of Perry and Perry gave him a lot of respect and a lot of kudos for the great trip. Perry explored for six days. One of the times he spent the most time on land was when he went around exploring on Luchu and they found this high post. And of course at that time, high promontories were important in regards to lookout spots so you could see all around. And this is Banner Rock on the great Luchu. Not only did they put the American flag on uh, another country's land, but they also gave a gun salute. You can see all the men shooting the guns off and <laughs> sort of like they had just climbed uh, the Himalayan mountains as, as the Okinawans look on probably in disbelief. The other uh, report, one of the other reports was the medical topography and agriculture. This was done by Dr. Green, who was a surgeon on one of the ships and not too much is in this report, but they did mention the absence of marshes and the pure air exempt the island of all miasmal diseases, all the diseases that the world was familiar with at that time. And one of the big ones, of course, was scurvy. 
and Perry was well aware of the problem with scurvy and they avoided it at all costs. In fact, he once said is that, that the, the plant, the crucifers, which he referred to them, and those are the mustards, were the key to the problem with scurvy. So he recognized that plant as being important. Uh, Dr. Green also reviewed a lot of the plants that were common, uh, rice, wheat, sugar, taro, sweet potatoes. These were all pr prominent uh, food plants in, uh, in, the, in Japan. The birds uh, specimens were obtained by uh, the artist, William Heine, with a shotgun. When they were brought back to the United States, they were examined by the ornithologist John Casson. And so he writes, John Casson writes the part of the narrative about the birds. They found 26, 26 species were collected and described. That's not a lot of species. Of course, Japan has a lot more than that. But they weren't duplicating a lot of work that had already been done by Siebold in the fauna japonica that had already been published. But they were mainly interested in doing, finding new species. And several species were new to the Western world. Of course, they weren't new to the Japanese, but they were new to the Western world. And they collected them with shooting. And this was another interesting thing because the uh, American shooting birds were with a, what they called a thunder tube. And this was sending out a great number of pellets in a discharge that sounded like thunder. And the Japanese were surprised when they heard the Americans shooting because they couldn't believe that two shots were coming out of one gun. And when the Japanese came up on the Americans, they said in sign language, one gun, they two shots. And they couldn't believe that not only did we have a shotgun, but we had a double barrel shotgun that the men were using to, to shoot some of the birds for the collection. At that time, the Japanese were still using the matchlock rifle of course, Japanese law against hunting was based on the Buddhist view against taking of life. So there was very little hunting going on in Japan, but the narrative does talk about meeting Japanese who were hunting in the same area where the Americans were collecting birds. And that was mainly uh, pheasant areas, and I'll talk briefly about pheasants. Another interesting thing, if you look at this picture, in practically all the Japanese scrolls, you'll see the Japanese depicted Americans facing forward uh, on the boat, which of course is not the way we do that. We always face backwards and row with more strength by pulling instead of pushing. And even recent years, a Japanese friend of mine asked me about how Japanese row boats because he noticed that they, they were depicted rowing facing forward as the Japanese were doing at that time. Anyhow, a little trivia on how we row boats at that time. This is one of the artworks, uh, the paintings that Heine did. And uh, this is a curlews, uh, 10 species of curlews in the world. This is uh, one of the four species in Japan, the bristle-thighed curlew that was taken in Hakodate in May of 1854. Uh, we have uh, two in the United States, uh, the, the wimbrel and uh, the long-billed curlew. We used to have the Eskimo curlew, but that's believed to be extinct now. The pheasants were of a lot of interest to the uh, Japanese uh, because of the fact that we were interested in importing, importing them for hunting. And we had people that were hunting, sport hunting for pheasants. And we knew that uh, China and other areas in Asia had pheasants. So this is the copper pheasant uh, that they collected in Shimoda in April of 54. And here's the green pheasant. I saw several green pheasants uh, one of my trips in Japan and they're, they're quite impressive birds. So those are the two pheasants. The Japanese also were aware of the predator-prey relationships. This is a sketch of a fox coming up on a pheasant. So that's uh, another interesting thing. Not too much written about the mammals, but that's the Japanese fox. Now I know you think, you look at this picture and you think I'm not making the, the, the social distancing important here, but this picture was actually taken last June. And it's uh, of me in a uh, library at the Mesa Sai University. I was in the rare book library. My whole life I've been interested in John James Audubon since I was six years old. I get interested in birds and I was impressed with the beautiful artwork he did. Well, Commodore Perry was also impressed. He took four, uh, the four volume set to Japan and gave it to the emperor. He also brought the three volumes of mammals, the quadrupeds that he, that he gave to Japan. Each one of these volumes weighs 60 pounds. And when I saw it in Wikipedia that Mesa University had a set, I got all excited and I said, I gotta go there. So, Last year, I went there, but unfortunately, I found out that the volume that they have 
did not come from Commodore Perry's expedition. And it seems like nobody in Japan knows what happened to those. So they might have gotten destroyed in World War II. Nobody seems to know. But they're beautiful artwork that Audubon did. And Perry was impressed with this and gave it to the Japanese as uh, one of the many gifts that he gave Japan when he visited there. Uh, he was, Perry was especially personally interested in the fish and shell specimens. He uh, supervised all that, but had John Hay in New York do the analyses and the, the, the technical details. This is one of the clams, thought like our hard shell clam that they got from Lu Chu. His, uh, one of the scallops, the pectin, but then also the oysters. They found out that the Japanese at that time were putting lead in the oyster itself, making these unique designs. I can't find any record that Perry mentioned about pearls being cultivated at that time, but at least the Japanese knew about putting some material inside the shell and getting these designs. Here's some other uh, shells that were collected on the expedition. These are gastropods collected by Commodore Perry uh, in 1854, and two of them were named for him, Helix Perii and Bullia Perii. So both of these species came from Tokyo Bay, and here they are close up. Uh, of the two species that were named for Perry. He also was interested in the fish. Uh, he brought all the fish that brought back were given to Brevoort, Dr. Brevoort, who did the analysis, 60 species. They collected them from uh, markets in town and then brought them back, sketched them, and then ate them. And this is another uh, picture from the scroll. Here's some of the pictures from the narrative of the fish that were brought back and then, uh, uh, actually these were painted, but the fish were brought back for collection on, and exist at some of the museums. This is the Japanese Huchin. Uh, at that time, it was, originally it was called Salmo Perii, named for Perry. It was new to science. The Western world did not know about this salmon and Perry was very impressed with it. It's the largest freshwater fish in Japan. So it was named Salmo Perii. Now it goes by Parahucho Perii, largest freshwater fish. And there was some interest in bringing these back alive to the United States and establishing them in hatcheries, but that was never done. Fishing in Hakodate was uh, pretty well studied by Perry and that's written up in the narrative too. Botanical specimens were one of the sore points of the whole expedition. There was one person on board, uh, Dr. Uh, Morrow, and he kept his specimens and he gave them to Harvard University to Dr. Asa Gray and he did not write up a report on the plants. And that's why volume two was late in being published because Perry was waiting for this report from Dr. Gray. He never got it because Dr. Morrow told Gray that it belonged to him. And only recently has it been, the report been written up uh, that, that uh, Dr. Morrow wrote. Here he is in Japan sketching some of the plants. All these sketches disappeared. All the plants are in Harvard University in, uh, Moreau only received $25 a month as a mate because he was, even though he had a, uh, a doctorate, Perry treated him as a mate. And later he petitioned Congress and got $3,000 for his two years work in Japan. <clears throat> he gave all the plant specimens to Harvard and uh, the book that was written in 1947 by Alan Cole is based on his journal. It's called The Scientist with Perry in Japan. Pretty interesting read but it was a sore point between Perry over the years or, or at that time when they were publishing. I just want to finish up with some of the uh, things that uh, I think of interest between our relationship with Japan. Uh, in 1972, the United States and Japan signed the Convention for the Protection of Migratory Birds and Birds in, in Danger of Extinction and Their Environment. This is a major treaty that we originally signed with Canada, then we signed it with Mexico, we signed it with Russia, and with Japan. So there's only four countries in the world that have signed this very important treaty that protects all migratory birds. And it's still a major uh, treaty and a, and a law that protects birds. Our two countries have worked together on migratory birds, including studies with albatrosses on island Torishima. And uh, the Yamashina Institute of Ornithology in Chiba and the Fish and Wildlife Service out of Alaska have both been involved with those studies. What's interesting is this island, Torishima, Bird Island, was the island in 1841 when Captain Whitfield first encountered and rescued Manjaro. Manjaro came back to the United States as the first Japanese ever to live in the United States 
And that relationship between Captain Whitfield and Mondro has gone on since 1841 and exists to the present. This picture of Captain Whitfield and Mondro uh, as a younger man. He was 14, 14 when he was picked up, but this is later on when he went back to Japan. And Mondro was a major factor in convincing the Japanese that the Americans were not barbarians because he knew a lot about us. The friendships established with Whitfield and Mondro and continued by Okinawa Science and Technology Foundation, the folks that are putting on this webinar, have endured over the years and allowed advances in science and technology for the benefit of both nations and the world. It couldn't be a better time to think about the importance of science and the work that nations are doing together, not only to maintain good friendships, but also to get the most information out of science. And as we go through this pandemic time, it's a good time to get all the countries, not only Japan and the United States, but get all the countries working together and sharing data, which is so important to solve major problems. And we're gonna see more of these problems in the world, especially uh, as our populations increases and we have more global globalization going on. I wanna end by saying uh, arigato to my friends in Japan and thanks to everyone else and happy if we have time to answer any questions. Well, well, thank you, thank you, Matt. That was a that was a tour de force, a wonderful presentation, and uh, and I think you can all see how much time and uh, how much in, how much joy Matt has uh, has gotten from doing research into the voyage of his famous uh, forebear. Uh, I was going to ask a couple of questions, but there are so many of them that I'm going to uh, uh, respecting David's time frame here. I'm going to. Uh, just relay questions that we had from the audience, if, uh, if you don't mind, Matt. Is that okay? Fine, sure. Okay. Uh, two people, I, Nolaka, and Ann Prescott, asked about the illustrations. Uh, who did them and where are they now? All right. The, the main ones I showed, especially the, the beautiful color of paintings, that was all done by Wilhelm Heine. They're all part of the narrative. Unfortunately, the uh, a narrative is not commonly available. A lot of those paintings are online. Uh, if, if you go on and uh, search on different browsers, you can find them. Uh, other than that, uh, they're hard to get. Uh, I'd be happy to send the copies I have. I photographed uh, or scanned all the ones in the narrative I own. The picture I showed of the three volumes, that's a copy I own. They're hard to get uh, nowadays. Uh, that one was given to me a long time ago, but uh, I've I've scanned most of those color photographs and certainly can make uh, them available in digital copies if anybody wants them. Oh, that's a that's a that's a very generous offer. Uh, the um, Susan McCormick asked whether Perry had permission to give all those gifts from the U.S. government, or was that just his idea? Give them? Oh, I think it was his idea. Uh, he he argued about getting money. The government was very reluctant to give him money to buy gifts, but he worked hard to raise funds, uh, I think a lot through private donations too, but he was convinced that gifts were important. He, and of course, what's interesting and based on all my trips to Japan is how important gifts are in Japan. So not all, not all countries have this uh, exchange of gifts like we have in, with the Japanese. So it was very important that he did that and he got a lot of gifts back in, from Japan, and uh, most of these are at the Smithsonian now. There's still a lot of material. I mean, when you think of what came back and forth on these ships, a lot of material that's in Japan that hasn't been properly investigated, and a lot of material that's in uh, the United States at Smithsonian that, that needs to be more investigated. The, um, great. Uh, Stephen Spencer asked, what was the importance of Okinawa and, um, and why, why did Japan accept the United States, the, the mission, the, the Perry mission? Was there some lead up, lead into that that warmed up relations between the two? I mean, lead up from Okinawa? Uh, no, I don't think there was much connection there. He went to Okinawa because he knew it was gonna be a soft area. He knew in advance that Okinawans were extremely friendly. They didn't have a, a, a huge close connection with Japan at that time like all the, uh, the main islands had, because they were so distant. And so uh, Okinawans had a history of being friendly and Perry knew that there was coal there. So that was the main reason he used Okinawa as a dress rehearsal. He knew Japan, uh, Tokyo was gonna be a tough sell 
And he, we, see, we had been involved with several missions before, the United States had, and other countries had. They've all been rebuffed. Perry was convinced that he was not going to fail. And he used the threat of force. And a lot of people complain about that because they think the only reason Japanese did uh, finally agree to the treaty was because of force. And there's some truth to that. But the fact is that he didn't use force. There was no loss of life. They had one incident, incident where it could have been close to uh, combat, but it wasn't. The Japanese were good on just waiting for him to leave. And he pulled a fast one by leaving and going to China for the winter because he needed supplies and he knew he wasn't going to get them from the Japanese. So he went to China, got his supplies, and then came back with more ships and said, I'm here to sign a treaty. And he made it really clear. So anyhow, Japanese certainly were not ready for him to do it. But by the time uh, he got through all his negotiations and discussions with them, they realized it was their best interest. If they hadn't, Russia and other countries would have probably come in after Perry. And the, the Japanese knew very well what happened in China uh, with all the problems uh, that they had through colonization. And we offered no idea of colonization. We had been colonies ourselves. So the United States did not want to establish a colony. We wanted to establish friendship. Great. Um, the uh, Hiroyuki Harada asks, how did Perry know about that Edo was the capital and that Uraga would be a good place to put in? Well, uh, he see, he never made it to Tokyo. He wanted to go to Edo. And uh, the, he threatened right near the end that he was going to go up all the way to Tokyo. And the interpreter that was on board said that he would commit suicide if he tried to do that. And that was a pretty strong statement. And Perry believed him because the Japanese were protecting uh, the Shogun. And actually, the emperor was in Kyoto at that time. And the Shogun was in Tokyo. And they were not going to let Perry go to Tokyo at any cost. And so, uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's why he finally settled on uh, original stop in Kuriyama and then in Yokohama for the, for the two landings that he made. And he was happy with that. And he finally, his final comment was that even though he wanted to go to Tokyo, it certainly wasn't worth the death of the interpreter by uh, making, insisting on going up there. He certainly could have, they didn't have any way to resist him uh, they had what he referred to as dungaree forts. They were forts along the bank that were made of canvas. And uh, it looked, uh, looked real, but we had the telescopes, and he said they weren't real. And, and, and speaking of communication, Zach Edwards asked, how did they communicate? Who were the interpreters? That's a great question, because uh, we picked up a Chinese uh, interpreter in, in, uh, in China when Perry came back. When he was first greeted, the, the greeting was uh, in Dutch. And the man yelled out, I can speak Dutch. This is a Japanese man saying, I can speak Dutch. <clears throat> no one was a good interpreter. The only good interpreter would have been Manjaro. Japanese didn't trust Manjaro. He knew fluent English because he had spent so many years in the United States. But they didn't trust him. He was in Tokyo behind the scenes. He was allowed to see some of the documents and translate. But he, he wasn't involved with the negotiations. So they had to use a very elaborate uh, translation system going from Japanese to Dutch, from Dutch to English. And that was one of the problems with the final treaty, because we had uh, one word in the treaty was differently interpreted in the translation. And that was whether we could establish a consul in Shimoda. And that's where Townsend Harris established his consul. But the Japanese said, no, both countries had to agree to it, and they didn't want to agree where Perry's interpretation was that either country could agree to have establish a consul. So that was one, one word of all the documents that was mistranslated or confused in, in the translation. But it was very hard to establish that, those translations. Uh, and Andrew Newman asks, are there, were there other scientific expeditions that were mounted in relation to Japan? Other expeditions by Perry? Perry or others. Were, were, were there other people who were um, uh, doing scientific expeditions around Japan? Uh, not that I know of. Good to get that question from Andrew. I met him on one of the summits, so it's good to hear from him. 
Uh, not that I know of. Uh, they, they were, uh, I, I just know that's a good question, Andrew. Uh, I don't know of any other expeditions that were going on. This was a major, you know, the interesting thing that follows up on that is because one of the reasons why Commodore Perry, Matthew Perry is not well known in the United States is because like his brother, Oliver Hazard, who's very well known in the United States, uh, Perry's, Matthew Perry is well known in Japan. And it's a curiosity for Japanese is why he's not better known in, in the United States. And a lot of it is because after he came back, uh, we had discovered oil in the United States. Whale oil was no longer of great importance like it was. So the, the industrialization that was going on in the United States and around the world with uh, getting close for electricity, coming up with uh, oil, petroleum from the ground, meant that our whalers didn't have to go to Japan uh, with the priority that we had in the past. So we didn't have that issue that, to deal with. But the other issue was that when they came back, our country was in bad financial condition. So a lot of people were concerned about the finances. And the biggest thing, I think, is we were in the midst of a civil war. So the whole idea of Japan went on a back burner. It was no longer important as it had been when Perry was there. So that was one of the reasons that uh, a lot of things sort of slowed down during the uh, 1860s because we were totally embroiled, not only in a depression, but then in a civil war. Right, and uh, uh, Jamie Kelly asks, he follows up on the question about materials, Perry materials at the Smithsonian and asks, where else in the United States can you see uh, either Perry, Perry, things that Perry brought back or Perry memorabilia or archived material? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I've been to the Smithsonian a couple of times with some Japanese uh, historian friends of mine. Uh, I haven't seen that much. Uh, we were more interested in a lot of the, uh, the uh, paper material. Uh, there, there's a lot of little, th one of the things is that uh, this, this sounds bad, but our, our gifts to Japan had a high technical value. The gifts that Japan gave to the United States, and Perry did complain about this, had low value. And the Japanese gave us beautiful art. During the Tokugawa era, they specialized in art. They had beautiful lacquerware, beautiful silk, tremendous paintings. They had a lot of beautiful art. It didn't impress Perry and a lot of the other people at, at that much as it probably did with the Japanese. And of course they gave us bales and bales of rice. And so there was a lot of the stuff. It's, it's at the Smithsonian. Uh, there's good lacquerware, there's teapots. Uh, uh, but I, I don't, other than the Smithsonian, I'm not too sure where other materials are. Okay, so the- uh, And it's difficult to find the materials that Perry, and that's what I've been more focused on is the gifts that Perry gave to find them. The train went to uh, 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 Hyago Prefecture and apparently it was at a naval training station and probably got burned. A lot of stuff I think was lost during World War II, but it, it, a lot of the stuff is hard to find. That's why I've been so happy when I found the telegraph machine and some of the other things. Great. So, so the, the father of the steam navy was not a fancier of art, right? The, uh, I'd say probably not. He was yeah. very impressed with technology and and was pushing the envelope all the time on, on uh, the industrialization of the world and, and the Western world. Okay, but speaking of gifts or, or what Perry brought back, uh, John Tasato from Hawaii asks about the, uh, the uh, stones brought back from Ryukyu that relate oh, to the Washington Monument. Good question. Perry got uh, two stones for the Washington Monument, one from Hakodate and the other one uh, from Okinawa. And when Perry went back, to, he was always interested in coins. He, uh, he got coins in Hakodate and, and coins in uh, uh, Yokohama. But when he went back to uh, uh, Okinawa, he wanted the coins. And they, they kept saying, oh, we don't have coins. No, no mint. No, we haven't minted anything. And he couldn't believe it. They finally said, we'll give you a large stone for your king, George Washington. So the Japanese really knew about George Washington. They knew we were building a Washington Monument at that time. So Perry brought back two large stones that are now part of the Washington Monument. That's a, uh, uh, that, that's a great story. 
we uh, I know David that we are coming to the to the uh, appointed hour uh, and I want to uh, I want to thank all of you for for your questions those were those were terrific questions and the um, sorry we couldn't get to all of them but I think we got to quite a few the um, the uh, uh, we no, Noboko Saito Clary points out that Sakuma Shozan wrote about the visit in his diary in 1853, which is called Uraga Nikki, the diary of Uraga. So thank you for that, uh, uh, Nobuko. The, um, let, us, let us join, let me join you in thanking both David James for, for putting on this, uh, this very interesting uh, presentation and for Matt, for all the research that he's done, uh, how, how much he's added to our knowledge of a, of a very interesting episode in US-Japan relations. David, may I, uh, you have some final comments? Well, thank you both so very much. Uh, Matt, that was a tour de force, uh, an amazing presentation. Uh, and I learned so much, and I think everyone who joined uh, did as well. And uh, thank you very much for it. And Peter, thank you for uh, stellar moderating and for getting through uh, a number of questions. And thank you to all the participants for joining tonight. Uh, I know that uh, there's a lot going on in everyone's lives, and I thank you and appreciate you coming out for this. Uh, I want to mention that on May 14th, we will have our next uh, webinar with Dr. Yuko Kakazu of the Subaru Telescope, originally from Okinawa, and is now a uh, galaxy formation expert. Uh, and on June 4th, we will have a scholar from Okinawa and from the United States talking about the impact of climate change on coral reefs in the US and Japan. So invite you all to uh, join uh, in that and you can stay in touch with us by uh, our website, via our website, uh, oistfoundation.org, O-I-S-T foundation.org. Uh, once again, Matthew, Peter, thank you so very much. Uh, this was incredible. Uh, I think people want another five hours and uh, maybe we'll do a follow-up uh, um, uh, at some point. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. And one, and one final note, if you see any loose copies of Audubon's 60-pound book in Japan, contact Matt Perry. Yeah, and the last one went for $11 million. Amazing. Well, thank, thank you all so very much. Have a great evening. Thanks, you too.